Thank you so much and great to be with all of you. Thank you for thank you to all of the organizers of this conference. It takes so much to put something like this together and to spread the word and to it's just a lot of love, a lot of a lot of passion, a lot of heart and I thank all of you for it and all the participants. You know, I believe that curiosity is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And your curiosity to learn more about food, about health, about how to make a difference with your life, about how to contribute to a healthy future, all of this is so profoundly important. So thank you for being here. Uh, there's an old saying that in the world to come, the learners will inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves exquisitely prepared for a world that no longer exists. It's my belief that our curiosity, our hunger, our hunger to discover is essential. And as, as, as technology changes the world faster and faster, as the spread of knowledge and information grows all around the world, we have to be in a state of constant learning because the world is changing so rapidly for in all kinds of ways. Some of them desirable, some of them maybe not so desirable, but it's changing. And so we have a, uh, a need in this world to be up to date as best we can about what's going on and how we affect it. I'm just tweaking my microphone because it seems like I'm on the wrong mic and you will you will hear me better when I'm on the right one. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. Technical difficulties. I think I'm on the right one now. Okay, so um, I'm just thrilled to be here myself to have the opportunity to speak with all of you because I'm kind of passionate about food. Some of you know this. I'm co-founder and CEO of Food Revolution Network. We've been talking about food my entire life. My dad is John Robbins, who wrote a book called Diet for New America that came out in 1987. It's inspired millions of people to look at their food choices as a chance to make a difference in the world. And, um, and so some would say he's kind of one of the founders of the modern food revolutionary movement. I grew up in a home where we obsessed about food in a mostly wonderful way all the time. I learned about factory farms when I was five years old. I learned about blood sugar and how added sugars impacted, you know, uh, the liver and obesity rates when I was probably six or seven. And um, and I was ran my first marathon when I was 10. Uh, we were very active and I grew up loving to eat. I grew up eating wild berries and lots and lots of kale that we grew in the garden. And so my whole life, I've been exploring what is food? What does it mean to our lives? And what does it mean to our world? And um, for those of you who don't know a little bit of the backstory, my grandpa founded an ice cream company uh, back in uh, the 1940s. And it was a successful company. And my dad, John, was groomed to one day join in running it. And then when he was in his early 20s, he was offered that chance. And he said no. And he walked away from a path of significant success and financial security um, to follow his own path and ended up moving with my mom to a little island off the coast of Canada where they built a one-room log cabin and grew most of their own food and practiced yoga and meditation for several hours a day and named their kid Ocean and they almost named me Kale. Um, so that's a little bit of the backstory. Uh, they didn't name me Kale, but we did eat a lot of Kale and other veggies from the garden. And I'm real happy that they chose Ocean, which was a more conservative name, if you think about it. Um, but uh, as, as the years went by, my dad went on to become a best-selling author, writing about food and health. And uh, one of his readers ended up being my grandpa, Irv who ended up reading my dad's books because his life was on the line and crediting my dad's work with saving his life. Um, my grandpa was given a copy of my dad's book, Diet for New America, by his doctor when he had serious diabetes and heart disease issues. They told him he didn't have long to live unless he made big changes. And my grandpa read the book and followed its advice and cut way down on his meat and dairy consumption, gave up sugar gave up ice cream, started eating a lot more whole fruits and vegetables and whole plant foods. And his, he reversed his diabetes, he reversed his heart disease, and his golf game improved seven strokes. He lived 19 more healthy years. And so, you know, I'm so grateful that we've gotten to see in our family how powerful food can be to hurt us or to heal us. And I'm grateful for my dad's legacy and example, and that I get to build on that in my life. 
my grandpa and his uh, brother-in-law, Bert Baskin, were pretty good at selling ice cream, by the way. Baskin Robbins went on to become the world's largest ice cream company. And uh, in the 1950s, my grandpa and his team came up with one of the most iconic advertising slogans in history. It was, we make people happy. And there's no doubt about it. Ice cream has brought a lot of smiles to a lot of people's faces. But I think we're learning today that there's more happiness to be found in health than in sickness. I think we're learning today that short-term pleasure can be delightful, but deep pleasure comes from vitality and wellness. There's an old saying that a person with their health has a thousand dreams. A person without it has just one dream, which is to get it back. If you don't have your health, then getting, getting just surviving sometimes can feel like the only game in town, getting out of pain, feeling okay again in your body. And so my perspective is that, you know, an ice cream cone is not going to kill anyone, but I'm so grateful that I get to now run a new family business advocating for a healthy, ethical, and sustainable food for all with Food Revolution Network and our more than 700,000 members because we get to help people to enjoy the real foundations of happiness, which is a healthy body and a healthy life. One of the profound realities of our times, I think, is that what we eat doesn't just impact us. You know, food is not just a commodity, it's also a community. It's, it's a web of relationships. And when you align your food choices with what you most want, not just for your own health, but also for your world, then something powerful unfolds. Your life can have more vibrancy and more dynamism. It can feel really good to know you're part of the solution. And, and I want to outline for a moment some of what we're up against as a species right now. And then I'm going to tell you how powerful our food can be to make a difference on that. So first, here's some of the really intense news we're facing. Let's talk about climate chaos for a second, okay? Some of you have probably heard this before, but I'll be honest, it's it's hard to take in. And a lot of us, you know, we hear there's a lot of bad news over there, but let's let's talk about what we know, okay? So Earth's temperature has risen about 1.4 degrees since 1880. About two-thirds of that warming has occurred in the last 50 years since, since I was born. So what's causing this rise in temperature? Well, honestly, we are. If we don't collectively start making some big changes, scientists predict the path we're on is going to have dire consequences for our life on Earth. The primary greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And they get trapped in the atmosphere and they prevent heat from leaving our planet, which causes the planet to overheat. But it doesn't just cause overheating, it causes chaos and rapid change. Storms are becoming more powerful, more frequent, and more unpredictable. Agricultural patterns are being overturned with massive droughts in some places, floods in others, and more and more crop failures. Insect populations are plummeting, which threatens entire ecosystems with collapse. Without pollinators, crops will fail. And other crops, including key global staples, are now threatened by pests that move along with warmer temperatures. As the polar ice caps melt, coastal communities, including entire nations, are being threatened by rising ocean levels and by saltwater encroachment that's rendering their wells and their groundwater unusable as well. So in short, sea levels are rising, ecosystems are being destroyed, species are going extinct, extinct and the truth is, if we don't change our course, we may look back at the 2020s as the good old days. Because according to most recent United Nations Commission scientific reports by the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we've lost the chance to reverse a lot of this overheating. There are no foreseeable circumstances that scientists can assess that we will be able to prevent the planet's average temperature from rising another 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit in the next 30 years. The pollution blanket that our industrial and agricultural sectors and our lifestyles have woven is likely here to stay for decades, even if we were to miraculously stop polluting tomorrow. So scientists are now projecting there could be more than 1.4 billion, with a B, environmental refugees by 2060. That means people unable to grow food, unable to live, 
ecosystems and cities flooded, they move, other places get overpopulated, overrun with those same refugees. So this is what we're facing, which could cause irreversible changes for centuries to millennia to come. And this is now considered by 95 to 99% of scientists to be unequivocal. So that's the bad news. And it's obviously pretty serious, right? Um, we've been growing and more than enough food for humanity for my entire life. That's not really the case anymore because of droughts, because of floods, because of desertification, because of topsoil erosion. We're now facing a situation where, and also the war in Ukraine and Russia situation has made it more unstable since they grow a lot of the grain in Europe. We're now facing a situation where there's barely enough calories growing to feed 8 billion humans. So that's pretty serious, right? And it could get a lot worse. The problems can be daunting. It can be easy to feel not so much like a drop in the bucket, but more like a drop in a vast and tumultuous sea. So do we have to throw up our hands and so hope that some miraculous technology will save us or that the world's energy companies will just one day miraculously decide to stop drilling for oil? Well, here's the good news. There is one thing we can do that can have a serious impact on climate change, like serious, and it's the food that we eat. By changing what we eat, we can literally change the course of the entire world. You may have heard that carpooling and buying more efficient vehicles is good for the planet. Maybe you've participated in a bike to work day or dreamed of getting an electric car so you can do your part. Did you know that agriculture and specifically the breeding and the raising of animals for food contributes more to global warming than all of the transportation sector, all of the cars and trucks and ships and trains and, and everything combined? Um, and it's, it's, it's not just that animal agriculture is responsible for putting global warming compounds into the atmosphere, but it's also one of the heaviest users of transportation, and it's a leading cause of species extinction and ocean dead zones. So this is why the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change suggests reducing consumption of meat, milk, cheese, and butter as a critical way to reduce your carbon footprint. So here's the really big picture, okay? It takes, it takes a lot of biomass to cycle calories through livestock. It takes about 12 pounds of grain or soy to produce a single pound of feedlot beef. And when we're gra grazing cattle on pasture, that takes a lot of land too. In fact, more land per pound of meat, ultimately. So what does this mean? Well, it means that globally, 82% of the world's agricultural land is being used for animal agriculture to produce 18% of the world's calories. It's like a protein factory in reverse. If just theoretically the whole world went vegan tomorrow, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but just play with me here for a second. If it did, we would instantly free up an area of land as large as the totality of all the land of the United States, China, the European Union, and Australia combined. That's how much total landmass would instantly be freed up, which, which could be used to grow uh, forests, which could be used to grow crops that are designed to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. See, we don't just have to stop spewing carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere. We've got to draw them down out of the atmosphere if we're going to create a livable future for humanity, for our children, for our grandchildren on this planet. And by freeing up that land, we can rewild. We can create the space to have the possibility to sequester that carbon. And perhaps in the process, also sequester it while growing awesome, healthy foods to help feed future generations of humanity with sustainable organic crops. The potential here is immense. So eating less or no beef especially is number one on that list, but all animal agriculture is very significant because it takes 12 pounds of grain or soy, as I said, to produce a single pound of feedlot beef, but it takes three, four, five pounds to produce chicken or pork. Anytime you cycle calories through livestock, you get massive inefficiency. A lot of those calories are going to hoof and hide and bones and feathers and manure 
and body heat the animal uses to move around and, and energy. And all of this is from a resource perspective, it's waste. And on top of that, we're producing waste. Our livestock systems are producing so much concentrated volumes of excrement. And it's not being, uh, for the most part, winding up going right on the land. When we have these concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs or factory farms, there's a huge concentration of waste in a small area, which then ends up turning into lagoons or other forms of pollution that wind up seeping into our groundwater, polluting our ecosystems, which is another set of problems. Uh, there's also the issue of deforestation. Right now we're destroying countless acres of land to grow food like corn or soy for livestock or to create grazing land for cattle. And we're doing it often in very delicate ecosystems like the Amazon rainforest. Not only does this destroy habitats for already endangered species, but it also releases the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere that those plants and trees have absorbed for us. And growing food for livestock emits nitrous oxide. The biggest livestock crops are soy, alfalfa, and corn. Corn is especially dependent on large amounts of carbon-emitting chemical fertilizers, which spew out nitrous oxide. So this is uh, extraordinary, and it's all connected. And you know, a lot of people talk about uh, worry about world hunger, and they talk about organic food, like, oh my gosh, it's less efficient per acre, so we can't do it if we want to feed humanity. We're going to starve if we try to go organic. And it's true. In the short run, organic agriculture tends to lead to a 10 or 20% lower yield per acre than commercial agriculture with lots of pesticides and chemical fertilizers on the same acre of land. That's short term. Long term, it's another story because organic agriculture, when done right, can sequester carbon. It can, re, re, it can add to the nutrition of the soil rather than degrading it, making the soil more, abil more able to hold water which means less drought, less susceptibility to droughts and floods, and it can produce potentially more nutritious crops long-term and be more sustainable for future generations. So over time, studies from the Rodale Institute and others have shown that it is possible to grow organic food in a way that can be competitive in terms of yield, yield per acre, but short-term, sometimes not so much. So a lot of folks say, oh my gosh, we got 8 billion mouths to feed, we can't afford to go organic. But here's the thing, if we eat lower on the food chain and we free up all this land that's growing corn and soy and other resources and alfalfa for livestock, we free up all that water, we free up all that space, and then, oh my gosh, we could go organic, we could go permaculture and still have lots and lots and lots of land left over. And if we focus on systems of permaculture and organic agriculture that are designed to sequester carbon, then what's possible? What's possible for us to shift things so that we don't just uh, eliminate the number one agricultural source of emissions of climate chaos fueling, which is animal agriculture, but we replace it with something that draws down carbon. The potential here is absolutely immense. and. So, you know, a 2018 article in Nature stated that continued consumption of the Western diet could lead to exceeding key planetary boundaries that define a safe operating space for humanity, beyond which Earth's vital systems could become unstable. So we're, we're up against it, but we can do something about it. And that's the wonderful, wonderful news. And so, you know, some of the best foods for the environment, let's talk about lentils. They come in a bunch of different varieties and they are super low carbon footprint. They're a fantastic replacement for livestock products of all kinds. And lentils are high in plant protein. They're super, super healthy. And they actually, along with all the legumes, they actually fix nitrogen in the soil, making it richer. Um, tomatoes are a great, a great from a carbon standpoint. Dry beans of all kinds are great from a carbon standpoint. And legumes, including dry beans and lentils, and also tofu and tempeh and soy products, these collectively are foods that are eaten widely in the world's healthiest and longest lived communities. They're one food that people in all of the blue zones, the longest lived peoples on earth, seem to have in common. Studies show that Eating more legumes can extend your life expectancy. It can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, of certain forms of cancer, type 2 diabetes, excess weight, 
So there's a win-win-win here, right? It's good for the planet. It's also good for animals. And it's also good for us. So these are some of the things that I'm passionate about. And, and let's talk a little bit about water because that's another huge one. My name's Ocean. So you'd think I'd care about water and you'd be right. I think water is pretty important. We live on the water planet. Although 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water, most of that is saline. It's, it's salty. So we can't drink it directly. Uh, only a few percent of the Earth's fresh water, excuse me, only a few percent of the Earth's water is fresh. And that's what we depend on. And most of that is locked up in glaciers. Unfortunately, that's melting and going into the oceans. But um, as far as fresh water on land, we depend on that. Well, billions of people right now are actually dependent for their water and for their agricultural communities on water that comes out of the ground. And this groundwater is being depleted at an unsustainable rate. In the state of California, where I live, thank goodness we just got a whole lot of rain. So we're technically out of drought at this moment, but we're still facing a water crisis long term because we got 40 billion people in one state and we still have a lot of wells. And those wells are where a lot of our water comes from. In fact, most of it. And we are depleting them faster than they are being replenished on the regular. So what happens when the wells run dry? What happens when the aquifers run dry? We're using up water that's been accumulated over millions of years. When those run dry, the pumps stop working. We put in deeper pumps. Some people are putting in pumps that go down a couple thousand feet. It gets super expensive to pull water up from down that far. But people are doing it because they're desperate. What happens when those run dry? It's only a matter of time. Some say years, some say decades before we've un we're unable to keep pumping groundwater out of the ground. Same is true of aquifers in the Middle East that provide much of the water for the Middle East and to grow the food that's growing in the Middle East. So then we have the potential for billions of people to be robbed of the water that they have built their civilizations on. They can't grow food. Serious, serious issue. Where's our water going? Well, it turns out that a huge amount of our water is going to animal agriculture. In California, alfalfa in particular. But it's not just alfalfa for cows in California. In fact, in California, we are exporting huge amounts of water in the form of alfalfa, which is a very thirsty crop, to Saudi Arabia and to China so they can feed it to their livestock. That's right. In a state that is the primary grower of almonds and fruits and vegetables for America and for much of the world, we have a water crisis and we're exporting our water in the form of alfalfa so that a bunch of other countries can feed livestock. If you ask me, this is lunacy. And the good news is that when we eat lower on the food chain, we can save up oceans of water. In fact, it takes about 2,000 gallons of water to produce a single pound of feedlot beef in the United States today. 2,000 gallons. This means you would save more water by not eating one pound of beef than by not showering for three months. And the good news is you can save so much water when you eat lower on the food chain. You can save land, you can save energy. You can create the conditions out of which we free up space that we can help sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. This is big stuff, folks. If you're somebody like me who is concerned about the future we're gonna leave for our kids, who wants to be able to say to my children, look in their eyes and say, I did all I could to leave you a better future and you're gonna get it. Like we all want that throughout history. Our ancestors struggled and fought and died so that we could have a better life than them. So many of us have ancestors that endured hardships we could hardly even imagine so that we could be here today. Isn't it our desire to leave the same for our children? To leave them with the financial security? To leave them with a livable planet? People would love to be able to save up to leave their kids with a home. Well, what about collective home? Don't we want to leave our children a livable planet with water so they can grow their food? with topsoil, with a stable climate? Of course we do. 
Most of us would give anything for that. But we've turned cold. We've turned numb because some part of us says, oh my gosh, there's no hope. And when we give up hope, we just focus on the narrow definition of self, what we can control, as if the bigger picture was beyond our reach. Well, here's the thing, folks. I believe that the serenity prayer is profound and wise. It says, you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There are some things that are absolutely in the first category. There are some things we cannot change. And so let us pray for the serenity to accept the world the way that it is, right? Arguing with reality doesn't change reality. It just makes life more miserable. And it actually robs us of our capacity to respond to reality as it is. Okay, so there are some, there are some places for serenity in this world. There's a lot beyond our control. But we also need the courage to change the things we can. There is a lot we can do. And future generations have every right to demand of us, to expect of us that we would do our best, that we would stand and work and eat in a way that we best could so that they would have a world where they could stand and live and eat, so that they could contribute to making a better world for their children rather than being caught in futile efforts for survival. This is what's at stake for us. And the, the, the beautiful thing is that it can feel really good to be part of the solution. It can feel really good to know that your food choices are an expression of your values. Mahatma Gandhi said, my life is my message. Well, folks, our lives are our message when we decide to make it so. And every bite you take is a part of your message, not only to your body, but also to your world and also to future generations. This is profound, it's powerful, it's real. So my friends, I wanna invite you to consider for a moment what the world means to you and what kind of legacy you wanna leave for future generations. And I wanna invite you to consider the possibility that when you're part of the solution and you know it, when you're eating with integrity, and conscience, it can feel really good. It's not the whole story. There's more we need to do. We could all go vegan, and that wouldn't be enough by itself. But it's a big piece of the puzzle. And, and here's, there was another study that came out a few years back, which looked at the costs of mitigating climate change. And researchers concluded that it would cost about $40 trillion, ultimately, over the course of decades, to reverse the climate crisis. Now that sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? $40 trillion, who can even wrap their head around a number that big? Except for one thing, which is that, that another study found that if we changed our food choices to go plant-based, we could eliminate about half of that cost. In other words, we could save about $20 trillion worth of climate mitigation efforts just with that one simple action. If we eat lower on the food chain and then use that land to sequester carbon intelligently. So $20 trillion then is still a big number, right? But here's the thing. The cost economically of the modern industrialized diet is enormous. We have uh, research from the Global Burden of Disease Report telling us that food is the number one cause of death and disease on planet Earth for humanity. And in the United States right now, we spend about 19% of our entire gross domestic product on what we call healthcare, which is really disease symptom management, right? Because 80% of that is treating the symptoms of chronic disease. It's not like you go into the doctor because you break your arm and you get a cast and it gets better and then you feel well again. No, chronic disease means it's something you live with day in and day out, incessantly, ongoingly. And you may take drugs, you may go through surgeries to deal with the symptoms of it, but it doesn't go away, okay? So 80% of our healthcare spending is on treating symptoms of chronic disease, not on helping people get well, truly get well, right? More and more of us are taking prescription meds on the daily, 
we're feeling like crap all day long, we're suffering from the status quo. Now, it turns out that the vast majority of the chronic diseases of our times could be prevented and in often cases even reversed with changes to diet and lifestyle. Credible researchers tell us we could prevent 80% of cardiovascular disease, 90% of type 2 diabetes, almost all obesity. We now know that we could prevent up to 90% of Alzheimer's disease with healthier diet and lifestyle and 50% of cancers or more. Put all that together. What could we save? What could we save in human life, in human resourcefulness, all the years that people wouldn't have to spend feeling like crap and feeling sick, sucking the life bed out of their family because they need to be taken care of in their pain and suffering instead of giving and contributing. Elders could be babysitting the grandkids instead of needing to have in-home care, right? What's possible if we liberate energy and creativity and human vitality and save all this kind of money? What's that going to do for our global economy? How many trillions of dollars could we save with healthier diet and lifestyle? It turns out that we could probably save, you know, a trillion dollars a year or more with diet and lifestyle changes if we optimize diet and lifestyle in the United States alone, worldwide, much, much more. So over the course of a generation or two, we could save more than all the remaining costs of addressing the climate crisis. We could save money. We could have a more robust economy. We could have a more vital population. We could add years to our life and life to our years. This is what's at stake, folks. This is the power of the food on our plates. Food can hurt us, but food can also heal us. And, and here's the other beautiful thing, I think. Food doesn't just affect how long we live. It also affects how alive we feel. When you eat the foods that contribute to cardiovascular health, you don't just create the conditions where you're less likely to die of the world's number one killer, which is heart disease. You also create the conditions where you have better circulation which might mean you have more pleasure, more aliveness, more vitality in your body. When you eat foods that help to prevent your risk of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, you don't just forestall a crisis later in life. You could have a clearer mind right now and more ability to remember the things that matter the most to you. When you eat the foods that help you to have more balanced blood sugar, you don't just help to prevent type 2 diabetes, you could also have more peace and more resilience in your life. The same food choices that contribute to pushing away chronic disease are the same food choices that contribute to more vitality and more joy. This is really big because on the end of our forks, we hold a key to planetary survival. We hold a key to personal survival. We hold a key to be able to give the gifts we were born to give. There's a saying that the two most important days in your life are the days you were the day you were born and the day you discover why you were born. Well, I say that when you eat the right food, you have more opportunity to live your purpose. Instead of being stuck in a cycle of ever-increasing misery and pain, you get to be a part of the solution. You get to make a contribution. You create the conditions out of which it's so much easier to love your life when you're not living in chronic pain. This is so beautiful. And here's the other piece that I think is important to touch on, is that food impacts the other creatures with whom we share this earth. I don't know about you, but I love animals. I've had cats and dogs in my life, and the experience of crossing the specious barrier and looking in an animal's eyes and feeling the love that we can feel, even though we don't have words, is so precious. I've experienced this with pigs. I spent time with baby pigs and looked at them and mama pig seeing them suckling their babes and they're so cute. They say that pigs are more intelligent than dogs. I've seen chickens next nestling their chicklings just like a mother hen, they say. Yeah, they take care of each other. There's love, there's feelings, absolutely across the species. So the thing is though that, that um, Humans aren't treating animals especially well. You know, we have laws against animal cruelty in every state in the United States, but, but in every single state in the U.S., we also have specific exemptions 
for those laws carved out when the animals are being raised for food. In that case, all that farmers have to do is do what's normal in the industry, and they're okay. Unfortunately, normal is unspeakably cruel. And in this, I want to tell you a story about one of my heroes, a man named Craig Watts. And he may seem like an unlikely hero to you because he was a chicken farmer in North Carolina. And um, Craig had been raising chickens for about 20 plus years on his farm. He was in the Purdue system, which meant that Purdue provided him chicks and gave him all the gear to use in his operation. He followed the rules. They gave him a rule book for how to raise the chickens. They give him the feed. And then he'd sell back the meat at the end and they'd, you know, he'd make a little bit to pay his, to, to hopefully pay down some of his debt. After 20 plus years, he was still in debt to Purdue from the original operation set up, but he was eating away at it slowly. He was not making a lot of money, but this was his profession. Now, Craig had to do some stuff he didn't especially like. In fact, it was pretty horrendous. So here's the deal. It was a broiler farm. It means they were being raised for meat. 20,000 birds in one warehouse. Picture this. Concrete floors. No windows. In fact, if there were any, it was any natural light, it would cause the birds to move more, which would reduce the feed conversion ratio. And it was actually in his contract that he was never allowed to open a window because that would create more, more activity in the flock. Now, the birds were standing in fecal material, not just their own, but the fecal material of generations of birds before them. They would clean out the floors every few years. They were bred to be morbidly obese, which means that it was the equivalent to of a human infant by the age of three months weighed about 600 pounds. They were so heavy that they couldn't walk later in their lives. They were given about one square foot per bird, which means they couldn't really even lift a wing. The stocking density was so intense. And because they couldn't walk properly because they were so overweight, they would lie in manure and they would lose feathers, develop sores. About 5% of the birds would be dead by the time it came time to harvest, aka kill the flock. So there's dead bodies lying around on the floor. There's open wounds all over the place. Birds are standing in fecal material. They can't even spread a wing. And this is their life. Craig didn't love it, but he was trying to make ends meet and take care of his family. Then one day he sees an ad on television. Jim Perdue is saying, at Perdue Farms, we treat our chickens right. They're happy and they're healthy. And Craig saw this and he said, I'm not a psychologist, but I can tell you our birds are not happy. I'm not a vet, but I can tell you our birds are not healthy. And if I don't do something about this, then I'm complicit in a lie. And I may be a lot of things, but I'm not a liar. So Craig decided to invite Compassion in World Farming to come on in with cameras rolling and take video footage of his award-winning Purdue farm. And by the way, he was being inspected by Purdue every week and he'd been winning awards for his production quotas and his operation being an exemplary one. So they came in and filmed. This wasn't some case of an undercover investigation of a bad apple, so to speak. This was a farmer showing exactly what was happening in a typical operation. And he filmed it and he talked about what was going on and how the birds were treated and what they were feeling and ended up becoming a news story. Craig Watts's video went, went viral and was on national television. And Purdue was not pleased, as you might imagine. They ended up punishing him and making him do these trainings. They tried to make it sound like he was a bad apple who just wasn't following the rules. But in fact, he was following the rules perfectly. This is how they told everyone to do it in their contracts. Anyway, the amazing part of the story is that it, it broke the story, it exposed a lot of what was going on. And Craig, a little while later, said, I'm getting out of the chicken business. 
He didn't know what he was going to do, but he started growing row crops on his land, getting rid of all the chicken farm materials. And then he started working as a consultant, helping factory farmers transition to more ethical and sustainable livelihoods. Can you imagine how much courage it took for Craig Watts to bring those cameras in? His conscience was bigger than even his need for security, even maybe the survival of his family. That's a lot of integrity. And you might not expect that from a chicken farmer in North Carolina, but sometimes integrity wins. Sometimes love wins. My grandpa Irv, you wouldn't have expected him to give up ice cream. He manufactured and sold more ice cream than any human being who's ever lived. But he wanted to live and he made big changes. And you know something, he was one stubborn cookie. If he could change his diet, if he could give up ice cream, then maybe there's hope for the rest of us too. So here's the thing, folks. What we're up against can seem daunting. It can seem overwhelming. But we also come from an unbroken chain of human beings who lived long enough to reproduce, often against great odds. In fact, for many of our ancestors, the majority of humans did not make it. Maybe they'd have 10 kids starting super young, and maybe two or three of them would make it long enough to reproduce. The odds were stacked against us in so many generations of human history. But our ancestors all made it to that point. That's a lot of odds against us. The odds against any one of us being here right now are infinitesimally small. Thousands of generations of survivors. And we have that in our DNA. So I believe that as we become learners, as we become aware of our condition on this planet and of the cost of the status quo, I believe that we have the potential now, every single one of us, to be a part of discovery and healing and transformation. Just like Craig Watts took his place in the change. Just like my grandpa, of all things, took his place in the change. Each of us has some part we can play, some role we can fill, some contribution we can make to be a part of the solution on this planet. And I think this is an extraordinary time to be alive. I think we have an incredible opportunity to make a difference. And I think that is such a blessed and beautiful thing. Now, a lot of people talk with me and say, Ocean, okay, I'm inspired. I wanna do something. I already do eat better than most folks, but how do you talk to other people? How do you convince them? Because here's the thing, we need to lead by example, right? We want to inspire others, though. We don't just need to do it for ourselves. There's a saying, put your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. They always say that when you're bored in an airplane, right? Well, we've got to deal with ourselves, right? We've got to take care of ourselves, self-accountability, walk the talk, live the message, right? In all the ways that we can. But then we're also social creatures who are impacted by everyone else's choices. So of course we want to influence them too. So if you're in a place where you're like, okay, I'm inspired. I want to do something. What can I do? How do I influence others? Well, let's talk about that a little bit now, okay? So one of the things that I've learned is number one, lead by example, right? You absolutely have to walk the talk and live it for reals. And the most contagious thing is when people say, wow, you look so good. What's your secret? Or, wow, you, you lost a lot of weight since I saw you last. How'd you do it? Or, you know, your skin's so clean. What's, this, what's the trick? You know, is it some beauty product? Or did you get, a fa did you get work done? Or you're like, no, I eat healthy food. And I smile, <laughs> you know? Or I exercise, right? Like, if you're fit, if you're alive, if you're vital, that is the best way to be a messenger of what's possible, okay? That's number one. Number two is be willing to talk to people. Not like a proselytizing a-hole, but like a passionate human who loves them. So, you know, if, if we just keep it to ourselves, we'll never create change. But we've got to do it respectfully and consciously and look for openings. Notice where people are engaged, what they care about, 
and relate it to that. Dr. Neil Barnard gave me this trick. He said, if you give somebody a book or a video, which is a great resource, by the way, giving somebody access to a film or a book that's moved you or a talk, one of the presentations here even that's moved you can be a wonderful way to stimulate them and inspire them. You don't have to be the messenger to give them the message. But you can also like put a post-it note on there or put a cover note on there that says, hey, I thought of you on page 73. Or I thought of you when I watched, you know, right around the uh, third of the way through this film, there's a section where they talk about X and it really made me think of you. If there's something that lands that's specific to them, that can be super powerful. Or we put on a Food Revolution Summit where we have an, ep we just had an episode on each of eight major topics in the food movement. And so maybe you, you, if you get the empowerment package from that, you send people like one of the episodes, right? So you know, whatever the resources are, maybe if they're elderly and they're thinking about chronic disease, you give them forks over knives. Maybe if they're younger and they're thinking about peak fitness, you give them game changers. There's so many great movies and resources out there. Um, find the ones that seem relevant and share them, okay? Um, number three, love people no matter what. You know, um, it's so powerful and so important to not make your love conditional on what people eat. Um, and they feel that. Because here's the thing, if, if you create a condition, especially with family, where they feel like, you know, you're going to think you're going to lose respect for them if they don't change, then it's some part of them says, oh my gosh, my sovereignty depends on not doing what this person wants. Because a lot of us get in power struggles, right? And a lot of us, let's be honest, we want to be right. And we want to be righter than our spouse or our, our kids or even our parents. We want to be the righteous one who wins in the power struggle. Well, here's the thing. If that's the game, you're probably going to lose. If winning is defined by beating them and conforming them to your wishes and your will, and that's what the game is about, you're probably going to lose. If winning is them getting the results they want, them feeling good in their bodies, them having their goals met, whatever those goals are, having pleasure, having vitality, having dignity, having joy, if those are your goals for them, then you focus on that. You focus on the big why, the big outcome that you have in common, which is an awesome life maybe, for example, which is them feeling good. If you join in them in that and food becomes a tool to help them get what they want in life, then you're on their side. And they may not agree with you, but at least it's an opportunity for them to feel your love and your support. Now, I want to tell you a little story from my own life. My dad was a great teacher for me around unconditional love. When I was um, five years old, we moved off the little island where I was born in the middle of the woods to suburban Victoria, British Columbia, so that I could go to school and be around other kids. And um, I started around the age of six, started going to birthday parties with my friends, and there was birthday cake. And... Uh, my mom and dad didn't want me eating that cake and I understood why. So they would make me, you know, these sort of uh, vegan whole wheat flour carob cake that I would take with me. They'd make me a little container. It's very sweet of them. So I'd have something else to eat that was just for me while my friends were eating the cake they were all excited about. And for a while, that was all good with me. But one day, curiosity got the better of me. And I was like, I've got to taste that and, you know, see what it's like. So, so I took a bite, um, ended up having a whole slice of cake. And then I was like, oh my God, what is my dad going to say? Um, but we valued honesty in our family and it took me about a week to summon up the courage to talk about it. But about a week later, I, I said, hey, you know something? Um, I've got something I've got to tell you that I'm a little bit scared to say. My dad said, Ocean, thank you. I love that you want to tell me everything, even what's scary I will always value honesty in our relationship and I'll never be angry with you for telling me the truth. What is it? And I said, well, you know how I went to uh, Damien's birthday party last weekend? He's like, yes. And I was like, well, they had cake there. And I was like, it, it, it. And um, he's like, yeah, I'm sure they did. And I was like, and um, well, here's the thing. Um, I had a bite and he's like, Okay, thanks for telling me. And I was like, well, there's more. He's like, what? And I said, actually, I had a whole slice. 
And my dad says, Ocean, thanks so much for telling me. I'm so grateful that you can tell me the truth. And then I was like, well, there's more. He said, what? And I said, it tasted really good. And then, and then my dad was like, Ocean, I'm sure it did. I've eaten more sugar, more cakes, and more ice cream than you could probably even imagine in my life. And I know how good it can taste. And then, you know, he said, and I want you to know, I'll never be angry with you for telling me the truth. Thank you so much for telling me. And I love you no matter what you eat. And then we started talking and we came, he told me a little more of, again about blood sugar and, you know, how the products in that cake affect the human body. And then um, we made this deal. We said, how about if he said, you, you're a kid, you can, you can have a perspective on what happens at these events that no adult can get to have. So why don't you kind of be an undercover investigator? And next time you're at birthday party, see what you notice about what happens to the kids when they eat the cake. So I started noticing that kids were playing happily at parties and then the cake would come out and afterwards they get in a lot of fights. And, you know, I, I started to get this, this perspective that basically cake equals misery. I was a bit of a James Bond fan at the time. And I found the idea of being an under, undercover investigator, fascinating and exciting. And I would report back to my dad about this. And so, you know, over time, I decided that occasionally I decided I had to eat some cake because I had to be one of the people and not, not, not ruin my, my, uh, my cover, you know, but other times uh, I would not because I wanted to stay sober so I could have an objective analysis of the situation. And I took my job quite seriously. Um, I think that what I want to share about this little story is how grateful I am to my dad for his unconditional love. I'm grateful that he told me the truth about food and its impact. And I'm grateful that he told me he valued truth from me more than performance. And I'm grateful that he told me he would love me no matter what I ate. And I think that all of our loved ones need that from us. They need the truth in whatever form we can deliver it. They need our respect for their truth, genuinely and for reals, no matter what that is. And they need our unconditional love. And what I want to suggest too is that we need our unconditional love as well. You know, we've got a lot of messages in our society about how we're supposed to look, about what an ideal body is. And compared to those images, almost everybody is too short or too tall or too fat or too thin or too brown or too white or too something. And all of these messages have a cruelty in them. Even our greatest supermodels torture themselves, feeling like they don't measure up, freaking out about every blemish. There is no perfect. There's just perfectly you. And each of us needs to come to terms with that and learn to love our bodies and love ourselves just the way we are. So to me, the goal of healthy eating isn't to guarantee we'll never suffer. It isn't to look like the greatest supermodel. It's to do the best we can with the life we've got to create the optimal conditions for wellness, vitality, and joy. And we'll get more of that when we love ourselves unconditionally. Even our desires for things that maybe aren't good for us. We love that place. And we integrate that place. Instead of fighting it, shaming it, blaming it. And then over time, perhaps we can become more whole. And more capable of making truly integrated and wise choices. You know, many people struggle with food addiction. Maybe you can relate. If you ever find yourself on the wrong end of an empty bag of cookies or chips, saying, why the heck did I do that? What was I thinking? But we were, we, were, we were overwhelmed with the desire. If you ever find yourself obsessing about food, you may be dealing with some addiction. If so, you're not alone. In fact, it's normal in our modern society. And food researchers now recognize, psychologists now recognize food addiction is absolutely real. I say it impacts us a lot more than most of us realize. It's shades of gray. Some people are completely overwhelmed and they're binging constantly, but a lot of us are pulled consistently towards foods that are not in our best interests. And that pull can be stronger or weaker depending on a variety of circumstances. The thing is, when you succumb to that pull, it gets stronger because you get more hooked and the pathways get deeper in the brain 
the dopamine hits that come with those foods get stronger and you start to feel worse. And guess what? When you feel worse, you need short-term pleasure more. A brain that is able to think long-term tends to make long-term choices and to feel better. A brain that is in crisis and fear and reaction and stress tends to react in ways that respond to momentary fleeting pleasure. So if you want to create the conditions for long-term vitality and wellness, then it really serves you to get off that treadmill. And one of the best ways you get off that treadmill is step-by-step leaning into healthy choices and coming up with positive alternatives. You want to clear out the bad stuff. You want to clear the bad stuff out of your fridge and you want to start having options. So if you find yourself snacking late at night, then you know what? Maybe you want to snack on celery and carrot sticks with a bit of hummus or some peanut butter. Maybe you want to snack on some apples, you know, sliced fruit, some frozen berries. Think about the things you can have on hand that that, that are good for you. You can snack to your heart's content on kale. I'm serious. Eat as much as you want. You will be fine. You know, I mean, this is good stuff. So so the thing is to repattern so that we start to crave the things that love us back. That's That's the art of shifting. And for some people, this is easy. They just decide to make a change and they do it. For other people, it's really, really, really hard. The key thing is that you can't make it all about willpower. It's got to be a bad habit. It's what you do when you're down and when you're tired and when you're stressed and when you're you're at your wit's end that's going to shape your destiny more often than not. So creating the conditions where you've got safety nets, where you've got resources and options can help you to make the best possible choices at those times. And you're going to slip sometimes, almost for sure, in some way, whatever a slip is to you. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn says, Every so often he has a piece of dark chocolate. To him, that's slipping. I would not necessarily agree, but to him, that is. And you know what? Like we've all got our spots, right? So love yourself and then keep leaning into possibility and positivity and making the best choices you can because your life and your planet will be the better for it. What you eat has a profound impact on your life. And when you create positive momentum, you create positive feedback loops. When you eat foods that are vital and give you more energy, then you exercise more. You feel lighter on your feet, which makes you move more, which makes you feel better, which makes you be gravitating towards the healthier foods that are better for you. When we're feeling better, we tend to do better. We tend to make better choices and the feedback loops get positive and you get reinforcement and you love your life more. And then you want to preserve your life more and you're less likely to make short-term reactive impulse decisions. We're less likely to ask, what do I want now? And more likely to ask, what do I want most? And those choices start to shift and our perspective starts to change and it gets easier and easier. You know, the best time to repair a roof is when the sun is shining, not when it's pouring rain. The best time to make habit change isn't when you're stressed and distressed, exhausted and fatigued. It's usually when you have a little bit of space. So on the weekend or when you have some free, a few few hours open, that's when you do your shopping for the week. That's when you do your menu planning. That's when you cook your legumes and your grains so you have them in the fridge ready to pop out so you've got ready to go meals. That's when you make a big pot of soup with all the leftover veggies in the fridge and then freeze extras so you've got them during the week when you're stressed. Planning ahead, cooking in quantity, these are critical components to helping you create the conditions for success. Now, another word about the social piece. I'm going to get personal here with another story from my own life. So I'm a dad. I've got kids that are twins, River and Bodhi. They're on the autism spectrum. They were born nine weeks prematurely, and they didn't talk for a very long time. They didn't walk for a very long time. We didn't know if they ever would until they did. They're doing so well. They're awesomely autistic. They're they're so courageous and they have to work a lot harder for some things than a lot of us do. But they're joyous. They love to dance. They have huge hearts. They love the food revolution. We talk about food all the time. And um, uh, But there was a point uh, when they were about 10 years old when River and I had never made eye contact never just had the experience of looking in each other's eyes and feeling each other. And I thought we never would. And then 
my partner and I discovered a program called Sunrise, S-O-N-R-I-S-E, which focuses on a relationship-centered approach to autism. Instead of trying to drag kids out into our world, the idea was we would join them in their world, make connection. The, the theory goes that autistic folks tend to behave with cyclical and repetitive patterns because they don't know how to filter in the way that a neurotypical brain does. So they're overwhelmed with sensory input. And so they're trying to get some sense of security and repetition gives them that. It's not that they are um, dumb. In fact, they're hyper intelligent and they get hyper saturated. So they're trying to find some peace. So they'll say the same things, do the same things over and over often to try to get some peace in the world. So the idea is that you join them in their behaviors and their experiences rather than trying to stop it. Instead of training behavior change, you connect with them. So it's all about eye contact and relationship building. And so one day I was doing that with River. He's, well, here's what's going on. So he's chewing on a Barbie doll's foot, which is something he did a lot at that time. He would just sit there and chew on the foot, seemingly oblivious to the world. So I picked up another Barbie. And instead of dragging his Barbie out of his mouth and worrying, you know, my gosh, this thing's probably made in China, where's the, what, what toxins are leaching into his body from the plastic and How's my kid ever going to have a dating life if he chews on Barbie feet all day long? I decide to join him. So I sit across the room and I'm chewing on a Barbie foot. And suddenly he looks at me. And this huge smile comes over his face. And I could almost hear him thinking, oh my God, there is intelligent life on this planet. So now River is beaming at me. And we're looking in each other's eyes. And I'm chewing on a Barbie fit. And suddenly that foot tastes amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. I'm looking in my kid's eyes for the first time in my life. And then River gestures like this. Turns out his Barbie has two feet. He's inviting me to come chew on the other foot of his Barbie. So now I come over and we're like three inches apart. And we're beaming in each other's eyes and there's tears rolling down my face. And we're chewing on Barbie feet together. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. So do you know why I'm telling you this story? Am I advocating for a new form of parenting where you chew on Barbie feet? Well, not necessarily. I'm telling you this story because it has profound relevance to our ability to influence others. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, you have no moral authority with those who can feel your underlying contempt. When we judge people, when we pathologize people, we lose moral standing in the relationship. How often have we blamed people or judged people for behaviors we did not understand and lost moral standing? They could feel the contempt. They could feel the disrespect. And they didn't like it. And we lost connection with them. So if there's anybody in your life that does things you don't like, you don't have to accept the behavior, of course, if they're behaving violently or disrespectfully. But can you find a place where you get curious why they do what they do? What's in it for them? How does it in some way, however twisted it may be, make sense to them? Maybe feel like the best they know how to do with whatever complexities or challenges they face, whatever traumas they may have endured. It doesn't mean it's a wise choice. Some people do really terrible things as a result of trauma they've experienced. But deep inside, most of us have got hurt kids inside or distressed kids inside of us that need love and attention. And when they get that love and attention, when they feel respected, doesn't mean you have to encourage temper tantrums but you understand that that kid's scared or hurting inside. Most of us have got a scared or hurting kid inside that can come out under certain circumstances. When we hold love and respect for that fundamental human being's experience, we regain moral standing in the relationship. So food is one of those places where a lot of people are not eating in their own best interests. A lot of people are eating foods that are statistically correlated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's and diabetes and obesity and making them feel bad and increasing the risk of depression and anxiety while they're polluting the environment and depleting the topsoil and consuming our water like there's no tomorrow and, and fueling the destruction of the tropical rainforest and the extinction of species. 
and fueling climate chaos. This is what's happening with the food choices so many people are making today. And it's easy to feel outraged and it's easy to want to shout from the rooftop, stop it, don't do it anymore. But here's the thing, folks. We've also got to love people. We've also got to honor the human beings who are making the best choices that they know how, often with difficult circumstances. Many people feeling like just getting enough calories to fill their belly is success. And if they can have a little bit of pleasure along the way, they want that. We want that for them. We want them to have pleasure. We want them to have success. We want them to have ease. We want them to enjoy their lives and enjoy their food, right? So aligning with that, honoring that, respecting that, respecting human sovereignty and human dignity and human needs. And then we go the next step and we say, oh my gosh, is there a way that they can better accomplish what they want? Is there a way that by learning, helping them be learners, helping them get curious, maybe possibly they could feel better. Maybe possibly they could have less pain. Maybe possibly they could have less fear, less suffering, less depression, less anxiety, better blood flow, less need for medications, less weight that they carry around, more ability to run and move and dance and love their lives. Maybe they care about the world too. Maybe if they really knew they could be part of the solution instead of feeling guilt tripped, maybe they'd want to. So we have the opportunity to get on the right side of people's souls, people's dignity, people's longings for their lives. That is the invitation. See, my son River needed to feel safe. He needed to feel accepted in his desire for security. When I joined him in his needs, in his desire, in his world, Suddenly, he was still there. He didn't feel threatened. I didn't drag it, him out of it. But we were together. We were connected. And I'll tell you, my son River doesn't chew on Barbie feet anymore. Hasn't done that for a long time. We have eye contact every day. He'll greet me at the end of a long work day, look in my eyes, give me a hug, tell me he loves me, ask me how my day was. These are all things that I never dreamed of 12 years ago. But it happens. He's still got his struggles. He's still got his challenges. But he's working on it. And we've got love and we've got connection and we've got our relationship. And that is so precious. So remember the importance of relationships. Remember the importance of love. And if you want to influence people, this is one of the most powerful things to hold. And also remember that maybe you know something, maybe you're learning something that might, just might be a benefit to the people you love most. They may not want to listen to you today or tomorrow. There's the saying, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. You know, everyone's got their timing. They've got their journey. Some people may not ever change. Love them anyway love them anyway. And if you can, maybe you'll find openings to keep making offers, keep making invitations, but honor their dignity and their sovereignty and their timing. They'll do it when they want to do it, if they want to do it. And you'll just keep being you. And hopefully part of you is the part that loves them, loves them enough to speak the truth, loves them enough to even have uncomfortable conversations sometimes loves them enough to let them know you love them no matter what they eat. So this is what's at stake. This is what we're facing in our world today. And this is the opportunity of our times. George Bernard Shaw said something that I think is quite eloquent. He had a propensity for eloquence. He said, this is the true joy in life, to be used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one. To be a force of nature instead of a feverish clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. He said, I am a member of the community. And as a member, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can before I die. Life is no brief candle to me, he said. It is more of a splendid torch, which I want to burn as brightly as possible before handing it on 
to future generations. So I want to thank you for burning your candle or your torch as brightly as you can. All the ways that you stand and work and love and live and dream for a brighter tomorrow. All the ways that you participate in large ways and small ways in contributing to making this world a, a brighter, more beautiful place for future generations. You know, it can look dark sometimes, but here's the thing to remember about darkness. A candle is most powerful in a dark room. Leadership sometimes means bucking the status quo. It means doing something different with your life than maybe the norm around you. And it doesn't just mean being an oddball. I think leadership means being adherent to your values. It means marching to the beat of your drummer. But here's the thing. When a lot of people do one thing and you do something different, you actually have more influence because you're changing things. You're showing another possibility like that candle in a dark room. And step by step, we're starting to shift culture. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I certainly have. In the last couple of decades, food is changing. And in some wonderful ways, we're starting to see more and more plant milks in grocery stores. When I was a kid, there wasn't even soy milk in supermarkets. Nowadays, there's soy, there's almond, there's oat, there's hemp, there's pea milk. That sounds a little funny, I know, but it's true. There's pea milk. Um, there's flax milk. Uh, there's rice milk, right? I think oats the big one of the day. Maybe almond is number two. Soy is number three. But all of these are getting more and more popular and competing for market share. Meanwhile, cow milk consumption is going down, down, down. This has happened really fast. Uh, we're seeing plant meats of all kinds coming out. They may not be the healthiest, but my goodness, are they abundant? And they do help people make transitions and see if something else is possible. We're, we're seeing uh, tofu. We're seeing plant-based foods showing up in grocery stores all over the place. Restaurants with vegetarian options or even vegetarian menus, as well as vegetarian restaurants popping up in more and more communities. Natural food stores in places you never would have found one before. And this is because of demand. Corporate America, the corporate food industry, is responding to demand. I've spent time talking with senior executives at Nestle and Coca-Cola, Unilever, many of the major, other major food brands. And I'll be honest with you, I can be really judgmental about some of these companies and their practices. When they're marketing junk food to kids, when they're making products that are devoid of nutrition, devoid of fiber, high in processed oils and sugars and animal products, and I know what that does to human health. I'm like, how do these people sleep at night? How do they live with themselves knowing that the more people eat their products, the more they're going to die, the more they're going to suffer, and the more ecosystems will be ravaged by the production of these products, packaged in plastic, with tastes that are designed to get people addicted. How do they live with themselves, right? But I've sat with these folks, and I'll tell you something. They don't stay up all night trying to figure out how to make kids get sick. They don't stay up all night trying to figure out how to ravage ecosystems. No, none of that. These folks are trying to make money for their shareholders. They are in a system where if they don't make money next quarter, their job's going to be gone. So they're trying to make money in a system in which the marketplace demands extraction of resources for the lowest possible price treatment of animals in any way necessary to secure the lowest possible price for their flesh, in which the marketplace demands packaging products, marketing products, and producing products that consumers will eat as much as possible of. What this means, in effect, is that they feel like prisoners to market forces beyond their control. And in some ways, they are. I spoke with senior VP of Nestle. She said, I'll be honest with you. Our products aren't exactly the healthiest. But we've chosen to make our focus making tasty and convenient food accessible and affordable to as many people as possible. Sounds almost like a social justice mission, doesn't it? I was like, well, yeah, but 
but you're making those people sick. And she said, well, you've got a point, she said, but we've tried making healthier options with less sugar, less sodium, less oil, less animal products, and they often don't sell as well. We've tried really hard to make healthier options, but it's tough. And I realized then, you know, if every company that does the right thing goes out of business, we're in big trouble. So we've got to find ways to make the marketplace evolve. The way I look at it, Food 1.0 is about survival. If you get enough calories to fill your belly, that's success. Food 2.0 is governed by commerce. It's about the buying and selling of goods. And it's bought us lots and lots of options in the marketplace. Unfortunately, it has no moral compass. And it's killing us and killing our planet. Which is why I'm calling for Food 3.0, where the central organizing principle is health. Health for our bodies and health for our world. And I believe there are healthy profits in Food 3.0. It's just they come from healthy food. So here's the thing, though. We as consumers, every bite we take is shifting systems and creating demand in the marketplace so that companies like Nestle start to say, oh my gosh, there is a demand for plant-based options. And they're saying that. The CEO of Nestle at a recent conference that I was attending on food security said that he believes that a third of the protein market will be plant-based within the next 10 to 15 years. So Nestle is acting accordingly. They're investing heavily in plant meats and plant-based food options. Tyson Foods, the largest chicken company in America, is a major investor in Beyond Meat and now is making their own meat or you know plant meat products. The writing's on the wall, folks. These companies can see the future. They know that a plant-based future is the only way to successfully feed humanity to address climate change. And quite frankly, it could help to stem the tide of obesity and chronic disease. So they're starting to get with the program because consumers are demanding it. Burger King didn't start offering the BK veggie in all their restaurants because they had an epiphany and said, oh my gosh, folks, we're destroying the rainforest. We better save the world. No, they did it because they could make money at it. That's what they're accountable to. So we have power. And as we start to shift marketplace forces, we're shifting the foods that are available, which in turn makes it easier for more people to do the right thing. When I was a kid, weirdos like my family eating healthy food had to work really hard to do it because there wasn't whole grain bread in grocery stores. There wasn't soy milk. There wasn't even tofu. But now there's so many options, so many resources, the plant cheeses, the plant milks, the plant meats. And now we're learning that, oh my gosh, we can also make our own and make healthier options, bean burgers and homemade nut milks and homemade soy milks. And it's getting easier to do that. And there's gadgets and tools that make it easier still. And the big picture here is that we are shifting the course of food history together. And we're helping turn the tide. And nothing less than our lives and the lives of our children and the future generations is on the line today. So you and I have immense power. Every dollar we spend, every bite we take, it's kind of like a vote. You're voting for the health you want and you're voting for the world you want. So let's make it count. Thank you so much. And now I'd love to take some time for your questions. You can respond to some of the comments that have been shared and, and address questions that have come in. Thank you so very much for that very powerful presentation. And uh, it was very, it was very moving and inspiring. So um, first, um, if you could just share, I know you mentioned it along the way, uh, like where they could find uh, your books as well as uh, how to reach out to you and get involved. Awesome. Yes, yes, yes. I've got so many answers. So I started Food Revolution Network with my dad 12 years ago, and we have over 700,000 members now. Our mission is healthy, ethical, sustainable food for all. We're trying to change the way the world eats, and we want to help everybody be a part of this revolution. So we've got a lot of resources that we put together. First of all, our website is foodrevolution.org. We have hundreds and hundreds of articles on our website on all the major food and health topics of our times. So check it out. 
you can Google foodrevolution.org and then type in whatever you're looking for and you'll probably find articles on that topic, whether it's oxalates or thyroid or immune health or heart health or just about any other topic. All the A lot of the major foods, if you want to turn, learn about soy, you want to learn about corn, you want to learn about potatoes, you want to learn about sweet potatoes, we got it. We got articles on that, okay? That's resource number one. Resource number two, go to foodrevolutionsummit.org, check out our Food Revolution Summit. Uh, you can watch episodes of the docu series completely for free, and that's a great resource. And I wrote a book, Thirty One Day Food Revolution: Heal Your Body, Feel Great, and Transform Your World. It's available where books are sold, and certainly online. You can get it on Amazon. It walks you through implementing all that we're talking about here. So, uh, thirty one chapters. Each one ends with a simple action step you can take to apply what you're learning. Part one focuses on detoxifying. It's getting rid of the bad stuff that makes us sick. Part two is focusing on nourishing uh, the superfoods that are super healthy, that can make us super vibrant and well, and how to incorporate them into your life in ways that are pleasurable. Now, chapter three is gather. It focuses on how to build your community, your web of relationships to help you thrive and sustain. There's the old saying that if you want to know who you're going to be in 10 years, look who you're hanging out with today. The people around us tend to shape us, but we also tend to shape them. So Gather looks at the social side of food and how you can implement this and be a leader in your communities. And then part three is transform. And that's where we look at how you can be an agent of change on the planet. This is kind of my personal favorite part because <laughs> I'm really passionate, as you can probably tell, about change in the world. And that's what we get into in part four. So that's all in 31 Day Food Revolution. And that's a great resource. And then I will say also, we're coming out with a cookbook our first cookbook uh, in October, and it's available for pre-sale now if you want to get a super early bird purchase of it. It's called Real Superfoods, Everyday Ingredients to Elevate Your Health. And this is a book I wrote with Nicole D'Andrea Russer, Food Revolution Network's lead dietitian and recipe developer. And we really focus on, you know, the real superfoods, which aren't like super high price, fancy dancy stuff from the other side of the world. It's the foods that can do the most good for the most people. I don't know any superheroes that only save the rich and the well-connected. So this is about being super because it can help people. And so that's a great resource. Uh, Real Superfoods is, uh, it's all about, you know, the cabbage and the legumes and the allium family and how to use them for optimal health and wellness and culinary delight. I see the question from Leilani, probably about the summit. What time or day did this start? I'm wondering how much did I miss? So the Food Revolution Summit just happened. Um, and so it's actually technically over, but if you register at foodrevolutionsummit.org, you can still watch episodes one and eight, and then you can also have the option to purchase the, the whole series for life with the empowerment package. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's the, there's the landing page right there. So just a quick, simple, easy way to register if you want to. And then you can also get on our email list from there and, um, and we'll let you know if we release it again in the future, um, for free. Um, and, um, yeah, summit was amazing, says Mona. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you so much for sharing all, all of that, uh, all the ways to get involved and to reach out. So we'll now begin our Q&A session. We'll be asking questions of the presenter. And if the audience has questions, we will open up uh, to the audience as well. We first just want to explain to everybody how this works. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we will ask we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand. If you're not sure how to do this, what you want to do is click on reaction on the reactions button at the bottom to, toward the right, second from the right in the Zoom window. Then you'll click on raise hand function in the menu that pops up. We will then take questions in, in the order in which they are received. When it's your turn, we, I will unmute you and prompt you to state where you're from and ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you. In order to give everyone the chance to get to ask their question, we will uh, we will not allow follow-ups. However, if you do want to ask another question or follow-up, you can raise your hand again and get on the back of the line. So with that, I see that we have one question from the audience here, and that is Dominique. Dominique, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, my name is Dominique. I'm uh, from Canada. And I was uh, really happy to see Ocean because I followed the Food Revolution Network Summit and it was amazing. I even bought the empowerment and advanced empowerment package because awesome. I have so many people in my life who have been 
well, who have been trying to um, get to drink the Kool-Aid, but obviously it's not working. And um, so you said love them be, uh, in re uh, regardless of their what they eat and stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm an ethical vegan, and I have seen so many um, horrific images of uh, animal torture than yeah. that when I see either, you know, chicken, whatever, I just see these images and I cannot be part of this. Yeah. So it's hard for me because I'd like to partake and to be, you know, loving and stuff, but it's just, it, it, it gets me to my soul and I cannot partake. Yeah. Do you have, so do you have a, any, yeah, I get it. I get it. You know, this is one of the hardest things um, to face. I, I'll, I'll say like, uh, uh, this is not a metaphor I use widely, but I'm Jewish. And, um, you know, I have ancestors who have endured a lot of suffering. And, um, you know, there was a time when Nazi Germany was using human bodies to create lampshades and you know, I don't think there was actually cannibalism going on, but, you know, some horrific things. And, um, you know, I think that to an ethical vegan, it can feel a little bit similar, like the notion of eating animal flesh can feel a little bit like eating human flesh. It's like, just because it's normal, just because it's, it's common in our society, doesn't make it conscionable. And, you know, what I, my perspective is that everyone draws the line of um, ethics in a different spot so like to one like, i don't know anybody who would actually eat human flesh right um and i don't know many people that would want to eat monkeys or dogs or cats because there's a sense of connectedness there's a sense of relatedness um but um you know i think then somewhere over there you've got in most people there's kind of a hierarchy maybe like maybe there's pigs and there's cows and then there's chickens and then there's fish and you know, and then there's, you know, um, you know, whatever, like you get to clams or whatever. And then, and then somewhere over there, you got plants. And then some people say plants have feelings too. Right. And my perspective is that there is a spectrum of human relatedness that each of us has a different sensibility around. So to one person, it's a really crisp line, like mammals, or it's, it's, you know, warm blooded creatures, or it's anybody that has a face or has a mom or a, do a, a dad, right? And then for other people, it's more complex and, uh, and more culturally defined. In the Philippines, they eat dogs. In the US, people wouldn't mostly think of eating dogs. In some places, they eat horses. Other folks are like, heck no. Why do people love horses but not love cows in the same way? It's cultural. And so, I try to have like respect for people's sovereignty to decide for themselves where they want to draw that line. And I know that for many of our ancestors, they ate what they could, you know, and survival was at stake. There weren't ethical vegans for the most part anywhere in human history. It's a privilege today that we have the option to choose what we eat. So with such a wide range of scenarios and options and to to supplement with things like B12 and omega-3s and specific vitamins and minerals that we may need. It's a privilege and our ancestors didn't have that. So when I talked earlier about how in the world to come, the learners will inherit the earth and the learned find themselves exquisitely prepared for a world that no longer exists. That's part of the point here is that we're learning, we're evolving creatures. And I do believe that plant-based eating is part of the evolution of humanity. I do believe that it's critical to our survival as a species and to our wellness as humans, but it's a relatively new option to have the option to go all the way to vegan and actually do well. Relatively new. I'm not saying there weren't ethical vegans in history, but there haven't been that many and certainly not going back many, many generations. So from my perspective, then I have compassion and respect for people who are doing what makes sense to them. And I also have my own ethical sensibilities. And I don't expect everybody to draw the line in the same place that I do, or have the same boundaries or bright lines or rules that I do. Um, I do believe that the same me that loves animals also loves humans. And I love animals that eat animals, by the way. I love cats and dogs, even if they're not vegan. They're doing what's in their nature. I realize humans have choice, so we may hold it differently. But from my perspective, they don't always, humans don't always feel that they have choice. They haven't always made that choice consciously. And so I just have a sense of like, this is another being. They deserve love and respect. 
And I know that my capacity to influence them effectively wanes if I pathologize, judge, and blame them. They're going to feel that. It's not going to bring out the best in them. So if I want to be an effective influence, I've got to find my way. And by the way, I think it's better for my own heart to love people no matter what they eat. Doesn't mean I'm going to condone it. Doesn't mean I'm going to be like, oh yeah, I'm turning a blind eye. I'm still, I'm grossed out by certain smells, right? Personally, I can't help but see the animal crying in a cage or being slaughtered when I watch somebody eating it. That's part of my experience. I don't want to dehumanize that, but I also don't want to dehumanize them, like doing what makes sense to them. So I just breathe and settle and realize there are atrocities happening on this planet every single day. So many of them, right? There's war, there's violence. Our tax dollars are funding things none of us want. And yet here we are trying to do the best we can as humans in this world. And so is everybody else. Not always perfectly. And we keep loving folks and we keep doing our part. Thank you very much for that. So our next question is coming from Mona. Mona, please state where you're from and ask your question. Uh, Savannah, Georgia. Thank you. I was wondering if your book was on Audible. Yes, it is. I read it myself. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Oh, that was <laughs> that was a quick one. All right. That worked out well. So uh, let's see here. Next question is coming from Marley. Marley, please state your name. Or sorry, actually, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marley. I am from Hollywood, Florida. Hi, Robin. It is a pleasure to listen to you today. Hi, Ocean. Um, my question has to do with your book and many other books. I have been finding it difficult to find cookbooks, whole foods, plant-based cookbooks in Spanish. Do you think that's something in the future that may be translated, like your book? Great question. I hope so. Um, authors don't really get say when over which which um, languages their books get translated into. Like, thirty one day food revolution is in four or five or six languages, but unfortunately, Spanish is not one of them, to my knowledge. Um, what we really need is uh, is a publisher in the Spanish speaking world that wants to publish it and then they can make it happen. And um, at Food Revolution Network, we translate some of our resources in Espanol, um, but um, but not, um, not all of them because we don't have enough Spanish speaking staff to provide full support. Um, but um, absolutely, um, you know, publishers in the Spanish speaking world that have an interest in these topics um, could be found, you know, um, there are there are some organizations in Mexico, for example, that are promoting plant-based eating um, and doing quite well with it, actually. So, you know, using Google and and finding them and then maybe, you know, seeing if they have publishers for their books and so forth could be a step. If you want to take that on, feel free. Okay, so I've got a question. Uh, so um, turning it to, to health, what, what are the most important things that you've learned about staying healthy and preventing disease? I mean, the cornerstones are lifestyle medicine. Dr. Dean Ornish says it really well. He says we need to eat better, stress less, love more and move more. So, you know, eat better means essentially eating less sugar and processed junk, eating less animal products, especially from factory farms and eating more whole plant foods. You know, stressing less means that we need to, uh, you know, have more peace, mindfulness practices, things that help us to cultivate calm in our bodies and beings. This is profound. Loneliness can kill faster than cigarettes. So the next one is love more. We need, we need human connection. We need camaraderie. We need a sense of belonging. And this is critical to our well-being. We're very social creatures. So you need love in your life to optimize your health. And then exercise more, of course, is big. We hear it all the time, but, you know, and, and there's a couple aspects here. One is consistency, like getting at least 20 minutes of brisk walking in every day is super helpful if you can, if your body allows for that. Um, the other is intensity. Um, so you, you need sometimes when you're like, heart is beating hard, you want to get up to like 150 beats per minute in most cases, if your body can handle this. And you know, so running or some form of brisk exercise, at least a couple times a week. And then the third thing to consider is, you know, um, 
you need cardio, but, but you also need resistance training and strength training to optimize your skeletal strength and health. And so weights can be really helpful as well. So there's all different tools and resources for exercise, you know, but I feel like if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's true of muscles. That's true of agility. That's true of, um, you know, flexibility. So leaning into whatever you've got, even if it's really hard, even if walking, you know, for five minutes is a big deal. Well, try four and then try five. You know, I used to be a marathon runner. And then a few years back, I had completely stopped running. I wanted to start up again. And I started with like running three minutes, jogging. And I remembered what it was like to run fast for hours. And now I was like jogging for three minutes, but I knew I had to start slow. And even then I was like sore the next day and I felt ashamed, but I kept at it. And the next day I did four minutes and the next day I did five minutes, slowly, slowly, slowly. And within a few months I was jogging five miles and getting it back. It comes back, but it takes time. So like have patience with yourself, have love for yourself if you're not in the best of shape at some point, but then keep going and, and make it a habit. But the other thing about exercise, and I'm emphasizing exercise a lot because I think it's so important to health and wellness. And we've been talking mostly about food. The other thing about exercise is you wanna do things that you enjoy, that, that you love actually. And ideally bonus points if there's social connection involved for someone else to do it with, because that'll make you more accountable. And you'll also getting more of your love need met in that process. And exercise is good for stress reduction. And by the way, if you exercise more, you're more likely to eat better because you're actually going to cultivate more actual body aliveness and connection. Um, I think mindful eating is also helpful, by the way, like actually noticing your food, having a relationship to it. Um, there are studies showing that when people grow vegetables, they eat vegetables more. There's also studies showing that when people prepare food, they enjoy it more because they're more connected to it. So also taking the time to savor, to smell, to absorb, to be in that relationship and to listen to your own body and not overeat. Michael Pollan famously said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think this is a great wisdom to live by. And the not too much part means you don't overstuff yourself. The average American eats at least 500 calories too much every day. And that translates to wasted money, uh, wasted resources, and also excess weight that we tend to carry around in our bodies. If you eat too many calories, you're probably going to weigh more than you want to. So optimal food depends on knowing when you're full and listening to your body satiety symbols. That's easier when you're eating real food. When you're eating hyper-processed foods, it's easier to override your body's natural impulses. All right, great answer. So our next question is coming from Marsha. Marsha, please uh, state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, my name is Marsha and I'm from New York. Um, I was just wondering if you could Tell me which book it was that your granddad read that changed uh, his life. Because I looked online yeah. and your dad wrote many books. Diet for a New America is the classic from 1987 that became a runaway bestseller and kind of launched my dad's career, if you will, um, as a food revolutionary activist and leader. Thank you so much. Sure. I'm going to read that book. Yeah, it's it's a classic. It's it's brilliant, even though it's been 36 years, it's still it's still got a timeless quality to it. All right, next question. So aside from animal products, what other foods cause damage to, to the climate and the planet and to our natural resources? You know, um, there are more and less resource intensive foods. For the most part, they all pale in comparison because in all cases, humans would be eating them directly instead of cycling them through livestock, which is like a protein factory in reverse. So there are, you know, nuances there. I focus more on the health impacts um, than because for the most part, all plant foods are such a big step in the right direction. That said, I mean, like from a water perspective, almonds are pretty consumptive. Um, so, you know, from a for example, from a, um, I mean, and legumes are awesome, by the way, from an environmental perspective. So for example, from that standpoint, soy milk is going to be a better option than almond milk from a resource perspective. Um, also better than say oat milk or most of the milks, because most of the plant milks have added sugars in them and soy milk often doesn't. Um, soy milk is also much higher in protein than anything other than pea milk um, because, and pea milk is made with, you know, pea protein typically. 
Um, so, you know, but there's all different pros and cons. But personally, I'm a big fan of unsweetened Eden soy or homemade soy milks for my favorite plant milk options. Um, and, uh, but yeah, resource wise, uh, less processed is going to be better. More organic is going to be better. More local is going to be better. So, you know, if you can support local farmers, community supported agriculture is one of my favorite things to support because you have a direct relationship with farms and there's over 10,000 CSA programs in the U.S. alone. There's, there's programs like this around the world. Basically, you get a share of the food grown by a farm and then, the, you know, the farmers have a degree of security because there's recurring income for them and you get a stake in, in their produce and what they produce literally. And, um, and you always get what's in season. It's grown locally. So if you live in a community where that's available to you, um, that's awesome. Uh, farmers markets again are wonderful supporting. If you can't do any of that supporting, um, you know, natural food stores over supermarkets, if you can, if they're available to you. Um, if you just have supermarkets or Walmart or Costco or something in your area, then again, look for organic, support local foods. If they they put them, they'll often say if some things are from local areas and they're often trying even in big supermarkets to have some local relationships. So those are all steps you can take that are meaningful and can help. Getting away from packaged foods can help. You know, you, you want to avoid um, things that are in plastic. We're practically drowning in plastic today. Um, and, um, you know, so those, those are all big steps. Um, we don't even, we try to avoid plastic even in our kitchen. So we store our food in glass containers with plastic snap on lids, but the food's not touching plastic. And those glass containers are of course go through the dishwasher. They're completely reusable. And, um, I don't want that plastic leaching into my body or my kids' bodies. So we, we don't use the nonstick pans with like Teflon coating, cause that can degrade. We use enamel coated cast iron um, for, for, for pans and then stainless steel for pots. Um, just thinking about all the ways you can reduce your toxic load and your environmental burden, as well as your environmental footprint. These are all steps you can take. Great, thank you for that answer. So what do you say to people who say that we don't, or that, um, excuse me, um, that we need animal products to feed the world? Well. Uh, I say that it's kind of the opposite. I mean, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, 82% of the world's land is being used to produce 18% of the world's calories with animal agriculture. So we can feed the world so much more efficiently when we use that biomass, all that ecosystem base, all that water and soil and space to grow food for humans directly. Instead of that reverse protein factory, it comes with cycling calories into livestock. So that's the bottom line there. Um, now, to be a little bit more nuanced about it, there are some places where small amounts of animal agriculture could be sustainable. Absolutely. Backyard chickens in some places, they're pecking around in the soil and chewing it up and eating bugs and pooping. That can have a place uh, ethically. People may have problems with that for a variety of reasons. What happens to the baby male chicks? Are they just killed? What happens to chickens when they stop laying eggs? Um, are they going to be killed? Some people I know literally have backyard chickens and they have old older chickens that don't lay any eggs anymore and they still take care of them, you know? Mm -hmm. And they feed them compost from their, and the chickens are pooping. And I don't have a big ethical problem with that personally. Some people may, and I respect all perspectives, not telling anybody what they should or shouldn't eat, but from an ethical standpoint and from an environmental standpoint, I think there's a place. Um, and from a ethical and environmental standpoint, there may be other, other animal agricultural options that, that could make sense in some situations. I'm not big on uh, fundamentalism personally. I'm interested in whatever works, whatever can help us survive as a species and make a better world for our kids and be healthy as humans is what I'm interested in. Um, but, um, you know, for example, bees, I think that honey done well, I uh, can, can actually be respectful for the bees and actually be a part of a balanced ecosystem where we're pollinating crops and giving the bees a home. Um, unfortunately, industrialized honey, honey is often quite cruel to the bees and steals all their honey and then feeds them high fructose corn syrup, um, which I think is just 
incredibly cruel. Um, so, you know, we, we have to draw our own ethical lines, but I do believe that there can be a place for consciously used animal agriculture in some places. There are ecosystems in the Himalayas where they can have yaks and there's like a huge amount of land and a little bit of grass and there's not much else growing and they have the yak butter and milk. And I like, I'm not going to argue about that. If the Tibetan people want to have yaks out there, like that's not, that's not my issue, right? My mm -hmm. issue is with industrialized farming on a massive scale for those of us who live in a society where we have choice and we have lots of options available right at our fingertips and some have very different impact than others. Okay, thank you. That's a great response. So uh, our next question is coming from Dominique. Dominique, please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, I, it's a second question for me. So I'm from Canada. I just uh, hearing you talking about um, the animal agriculture that could be possible. What do you think, Ocean, about eating um, insects? <laughs> well, um, I think it sounds gross personally. That's just me, right? Maybe other people feel that way too. But I'll put that aside for a second. Let's imagine. And I, and I, and I, I don't love the idea of, of killing insects, right? Like they are still a living creature that would probably fly away if it could and doesn't want to die. So I suspect ethically that it's not going to fit with my personal sensibilities from a, uh, but, but do I, like I talked earlier about that spectrum, like I would rather eat an insect than eat a pig or a cow or a dog or a cat, you know, right. Personally. So my sensibility is it's somewhere over there, but I think I, it's on the, on the, on the closer side of the line for me personally, but I respect humans doing what makes sense to them from a, um, from an environmental standpoint, insects, uh, what are they fed and do they produce waste? Um, and that's the big question. Is it sustainable or is it the same protein factory universe? Are we going to feed them feedstuffs that are growing on land that inefficiently is cycled through them? Or are they actually consuming waste? Uh, it matters a lot what they're eating and where they're living and what waste products come out of it. And animal agriculture doesn't have a very good reputation in this regard. Fish farms are an environmental disaster and an, environment, and an ethical disaster, at least in most cases today. Um, we're literally giving fish antibiotics to keep them alive under deplorable conditions. We're feeding them fish from the wild oceans and getting a terrible feed conversion ratio, like three or four or five to one. So again, we're wasting all these calories. So we think the fish farms are like helping preserve the wild oceans, but they're actually the opposite. And they're producing a massive amounts of pollution. And the fish are living in horrible conditions surrounded by a sea of fecal material super unnatural because they're so concentrated. So there tend to be downsides to all of this, but show me an option where it actually works, where it's sustainable, where it's taking waste and making something that humans could eat. And I'm like, you know what, from an environmental standpoint, if it actually works, I'm open-minded to learning more. And then there's the ethical considerations, which I may still not partake, but you know what, like I'm, we're, we're in a serious situation in the world today. I was always against nuclear power I'm not anymore. You know, it's not my favorite form of electricity. But at this point, I feel like with what we're facing in the world, we're going to have to make some trade-offs. So if it could be part of the solution, I'm curious. I feel the same about lab meat. Like, I'm not a fan. I'm probably not ever going to eat it. But if it can help save our world and give us a world that our children can inherit, then you know what? Like, I'm open-minded right? There's some trade-offs. I'm not a fundamentalist. I want whatever works. That's kind of my take on it. Great. Thank you, Ocean. So uh, based on uh, on what you've learned and, and the, the current information out there, uh, how many more years will the planet, if, if things go on the way that they are and we don't make a, a major shift, how many more years will the planet be able to provide food but, uh, before climate change makes it challenging? for uh, for us to provide food for the world's population? It's already challenging for a lot of people. We're already running out of water in many parts of the world. We're already facing droughts and floods and uh, water, salt water intrusion. Um, 
and it's it's gonna get it's it's not like there's a tipping point moment it's like it gets worse and worse and it maybe that accelerates with the the path that we're on um so you know i think that we could be looking at a world within the next generation where we have you know a billion people starving to death or more um we're hearing about by 2060 1.4 billion environmental refugees um being projected by the united nations um there's 1.4 billion refugees where are they going to go are they going to compete with other populations for scarce resources is that going to lead to war i mean we could have some really dark prospects as a species um Florida could be underwater within a generation. New York City could be underwater. These are not just science fiction stories. These are scientific probabilities uh, that some of us may unfortunately live to see. But at the same time, I think it's really important to remember that let's suppose that we can grow enough food to feed 1.4 billion less humans in a generation. Well, if we eat lower on the food chain, we can more than make up for that. We could probably feed a population of 12, 15 billion with current resources just by eating plant-based. And so if we lose some of that, but we make the shift, then we'll still have more than enough for quite some time. Great. Thank you so much for that, Ocean. So thank you very much for the presentation and, and the, uh, the Q&A. So um, just so that everyone else can also share in their uh, their appreciation for your uh, presentation and time, we're going to unmute the uh, the audience, and you'll hear a whole cacophony of of thanks. Pouring. Okay, let me just say that was a really dark note. So before they do that, I've just got to say like oh. thank you for caring. We we learn because we care, and if you're feeling any sadness in your heart right now or heaviness, that's because you care. Thank you for being a human being who cares. I think love can change the game. I think that when our hearts are open, we're cap capable of so much ingenuity, creativity, healing, and transformation. So thank you for the resilience. Thank you for the curiosity. Thank you for caring about the world around us. I'm so grateful. You all give me hope. Thank you. Thank you. We Thank love you. you. Oh, Sharon, Sharon, I, I love, love you. you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you from the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.